So church, I'm going to read to you really quickly for a moment to set you up, and then I'll have you stand uh, and do our normal reading, but you can remain seated right now. We're looking at this section of scripture. We're in part three of our message uh, titled, When Eyes Can Hear Us. We're talking about the fact when eyes can hear us. It's a strange phrase, I know, but it really factually describes the Christian walk because the fact of the matter is what people see uh, speaks to them. Okay, how you and I live, our neighbors may never talk to us, but what they're seeing speaks to them. They hear it. They look and they hear. And the Bible is very, very serious about that reality. And so we thus have this title. But you guys know that we've been looking at uh, this presentation by Paul to the church at Rome and he's using the witness of Abraham. He will do that throughout uh, portions of the book. Uh, but also David. And it's quite remarkable. What's interesting, if you're Jewish today, uh, traditionally, Abraham and David have been the, the pillars of Jewish experience. Abraham, David. Abraham and David. But in the last several hundred years, it's been Abraham and Moses. It's shifted. It's shifted. It's shifted away. And I understand that because David, his life was a very much of a born again relationship with God. He wasn't born again. That didn't happen until, until John chapter 20. But David's life lived out is very much like yours. I mean, you may not be you know, sleeping with Bathsheba and killing giants, uh, you know, one extreme to the other, because when David fell, he fell big. And when David had uh, faith, it was big. Okay, but his life was very dynamic in the sense of his spiritual relationship with God was very personal, very constant, and very much like a modern day believer here in the 21st century. So it'd be great for you on your own to do a biographical study of the life of David. But Abraham is a hero to us because he's justified by faith. And that is the key message that God gave to not only Jew but Gentile alike. That God saves you not based upon any works of righteousness of your own. Membership of a church. How much money you give. Or what kind of good deeds you've performed. God declares you righteous because simply this, that you take him at his word. You believe him at his word. You know, we know that as humans. It's pretty hurtful when you tell somebody that you love something that is absolutely true and honest, and you might express your, your passion or your love for them, and they say, oh, come on, quit goofing around. That just, that puts a ding. You know a ding, a dent in your surfboard? It puts a ding in your heart. And it hurts because what you extended is meaningful and it's personal and it's a big deal. And then it gets stepped on. God spoke to Abraham and Abraham said, okay, Lord. I mean, of course, God did not do what I'm about to do. But I would understand that where God would say, wait a minute, what did you just say? <laughs> of course, God knows. But it blessed God. When Abraham took God at his word, it blessed God. That's the call upon your life and mine, to bless God. How do we do that? Believe him. Amen. Just believe him. Well, what else does you want me to do? Just believe him. When he says what he says in the Bible, believe it. See, well, I don't know if the Bible's true or not. Listen, open it up, read it, and ask God, if this is true, let me know. And he'll show himself to you. Amen. Quite remarkable. But this is how it happened. Listen, I'm going to read you Genesis 15 and a portion of uh, Psalm 32, which relates to the section that we're studying. Genesis 15, beginning at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And Abram said, Lord God... What will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. That was his servant. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. 
And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this is God speaking now, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your body shall be your heir. Now this is hilarious because he's a very, very old man and Sarah's womb is more accurately Sarah's tomb. (laughs) She's old and she's beyond childbearing years. They are old, old people. (laughs) Then God brought him outside, verse 5, and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. You can't. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed in the Lord. And he, that is God, the Lord, accounted it to him for righteousness. This is the book of Genesis, friends. Chapter 15, verse 6. Listen, I want to remind all of you, Gentile, Jew, Muslim alike. God says, this is the answer. Verse 6. Listen, Genesis 15, 6 is just as home there as it is in the New Testament. Did you know that? Remarkable. Then Psalm 32. Psalm 32 verse 1 says this. Psalm of David. Blessed. Listen to this. Blessed. The word actually means happy. You want to be happy? There's only one way to be happy. No God. Happy. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Or there's no uh, dishonesty. Check this out. Look at that statement. That verse lived out is a New Testament experience. This is your life now as a believer. The Bible says you ought to be happy because God no longer has to forgive you of your transgressions because they've been forgiven at the cross. Secondly, your sin is covered. Covered is not a powerful enough word. It's actually removed. We would use the word erased. Does the word expunged fit? It's gone. We'll see how so as we get into our study. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. This is amazing. No longer is God looking at you with a clipboard as a believer and saying, oh, you know what? You, you did five good things today, but you did three bad things today. And the Bible says God in the believer's life is no longer keeping a record of wrong Because Jesus at the cross removed all that. There's no more note-taking by God anymore about what you and I do wrong. What you and I do when we do wrong, we are to do the 1 John 1, 9 thing. Do you know the 1 John 1, 9 thing? The 1 John 1, 9 thing is this, written to believers. That he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. If we call out to him... And ask him to forgive us, he will forgive us. What is that relationship all about? It's about fellowship. Amen. Has nothing to do about heaven or hell. Has nothing to do about getting kicked out of the family. It's only written to those who are in the family. Amen. And you know this. You know this about your own kid. When your kid does something wrong and then five minutes later it comes out of their room because you told them to go to their room. At least that's modern day parenting. Look, how many of you guys are over over? I don't know, over 60? Raise your hand. Over 60? I don't know about you, the house you grew up in. My dad didn't say anything. <laughs> Never said a word. Mm-hmm. When we woke up, then we asked him, what did I do wrong? <laughs> Man, remember those days? And, uh, but, what was I talking about? I totally got off... <laughs> Yes, when your little one does something wrong, you say, go to your room. You're in trouble. Go to your room. And if they go to their room and then two minutes later come out and say, you know, I know it's a week away from my birthday. Can we discuss what I'm going to get for my birthday? What are you going to tell them? Go to your room. You want to know why you're going to say go to, the, go to their room? Because it's your kid, it's your house, and you're sending them to the room that you're letting them use. Amen. Their room. <laughs> They're your kid. They'll always be your kid, but fellowship is broken, right? Because of sin. Not salvation. We're in the family. 
David knew that relationship. Abraham knew that relationship. It's very awesome. So church, let's stand together if you would, and we'll read verses chap- or chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. You guys know it well. It's our third week. You're, you didn't know that these Sundays and Wednesdays would be scripture memorization. <laughs> so, uh, but still, for some of us, it's a challenge still. I'll read verse 1. If you pick it up in verse 2, what then shall we say that Abraham our father is found according to the flesh? For what does the scripture say? What does the Bible, the Old Testament say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Absolutely awesome. Church, we've been looking at this challenge, really, of reality in the believer's life when eyes can hear us. We're talking about our witness, but you got to have a witness uh, to. Be one that shows the power of God in your life. We call it a testimony. We'll talk more of this in a moment. But uh, as, as a Christian, you should be able to recount in some way, shape, or form a testimony as to how you came to Christ. Now listen, I have that testimony in my life, but Lisa, my wife, she doesn't have a testimony like I have, uh, but she does have a testimony like many of you have. Uh, Lisa grew up in a very godly home, and so she can't tell you, you know, she can't tell you, on this day, the sky parted, and Jesus knocked me to my feet, and and I, uh, you know, no, she grew up always learning about Jesus, and she can't put her finger on the moment she came to Christ, but she remembers somewhere around five or six years of age praying to accept Christ, But she had known about him, but time had come for her to say, yes, I want him. And then those teen years came into her life, like they came into all of our lives. And she never walked away from him, but she argued with him. And to argue with him is to have a relationship still with him. And so she navigated those years with Jesus. I didn't have Christ. And so I was on my own, so to speak. Maybe you can relate to that. The pendulum swings to the other side. Listen, in my wife's life, her testimony is God's keeping power. Okay, in some of our lives, it's, yeah, you know what? I was a murderer and a hell's angel. And I used to, you know, well, I'm, whatever your thing was, that's yours. That's yours. But God works in our lives and We have a testimony. And we saw this in the positive. It demands it. The way the Greek is structured in this argument of Romans 4, we saw in verses 1 and 2 that there's nowhere to hide. That's a good thing. We saw in verses 1 to 2 that our flesh testifies against us. That's a good thing. That our deeds can never measure up. That's a good thing. And that our pride is laid low before the throne of God. That's a good thing. We saw last Sunday that there's no way to lose. The Christian will never, can never lose. Lose at what? You name it. Even though in this life we're under persecution, even though in this life we're being singled out and attacked, even though in this life that will increase. Why? Because this world's not our home. Hallelujah. We don't feel at home here anymore. Thank God for that. But because our citizenship is secure in heaven, God's on his throne, the Bible tells us that no evil, no sin will prevail against us as believers, that we've been given the Holy Spirit's power to conquer the attack that comes against us, that we cannot lose. And we saw that in chapter, or chapter 4, verse 3. We saw that salvation is founded on Scripture And we said amen to that. We saw that in verse 3. We saw that salvation is independent from human effort. Boy, aren't you glad. 
man, I hope, man, I tell you, if you get hold of this stuff, it's going to set you free. Look, I've known this for a long time, but I got to tell you, because I, I was born and raised in a really great church that taught just like this, but I got to tell you something, every day that I get older and this truth settles in, um, I guess for those of you who understand wine, there's some, you know, I guess wine gets older, gets better. And uh, the Bible in you is like that. It's, it gets better. So, that it, so for me, walking with Jesus for 45 years, um, all of this truth, it's like, yes. It's better now than it was at the beginning. It ages well, his truth. You know? And so thank God, when I read and when I see scripture where it's independent of human effort, uh, my salvation is, it's like, oh, Yes. But do you know what the funny thing is? As soon as you realize that and then get re- remind, re- remembered of it, <laughs> reminded of it, it's like, this is sweeter. So now uh, you want to be more, I think, outgoing regarding what's inside of you. Like we talked about the percolator and the, and the coffee coming up out of you, so to speak, or the well springing up. We saw last time in verse 4, too, you guys, that now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. You don't ever want to be in that situation with God when you're working your relationship with God. That you come to the end of the day and you say, I think, I think my good deeds outweighed my bad deeds. My dear friend, you are working with God as a, as a laborer, not as a bride or not as a friend. God owes you nothing, he will never owe you nothing, and he will never become indebted, no matter what you do, ever. You would never want to be relating to God on a works-based relationship. You'll never have peace, you'll never enjoy salvation. It's a challenge, to say the least. And so church, today we pick it up in our third argument, and it's in verses six through eight, and that is this, please mark it down. There's no greater experience. There's no greater experience. When we talk about when eyes can hear us, what the world should see coming from the believer is the fact that our lives exhibit the greatest experience that a human can have in this world. Church, please listen to me. What I'm about to say is going to sound bombastic. It's going to sound sound, uh, impossible. Let Let me set it up this way. In this world... The world is doing everything it can to have a fantastic life, whatever that means. The world is spending every dime to get the best, biggest high it can experience, whatever that means. The world is trying to prop itself up in such a way that when you look at it, you're in awe of it, whatever that means. I submit to you this morning that the world is trying to achieve what has been placed inside you and I. They want to experience it, but they miss it because they won't come to him. You and I have come to him, but we don't allow it in our lives. What is that? We read a moment ago, and we're going to read again today, blessed, 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 God says to his children, blessed, happy are you, happy are you. Some translations put it this way, uh, welfare to you, welfare to you, welfare, or we would use the word farewell to you, not, not goodbye to you, but as, as you are, may you fare well, or may you have well fare, a good life, a blessed life. People take this, by the way, and they twist it, and they make it into some positive confession word faith movement, and that's dangerous. God blesses obedience, period. But isn't that works? Nope. Obedience comes out of a heart of love for the God that has forgiven you of your sins. What is that? Taking him at his word. Genesis 15, 6, isn't it? It's just believing God. You pick up the Bible, and this is an awesome thing about our God. If you pick up the Bible and there's something in there that's too hard for you to believe, tell them. Amen. Don't go like this. And, and so I've loved you with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn you. In your mind you say, man, I don't know if I believe that. 
but then out, outwardly you go, thank you, God. <laughs> Don't do that. No. Tell them, that's really hard for me to take in. God, I'm really struggling with that verse. You love me that much? Or whatever it might be. Everything he says to you is grounded in his incredible love for you. You may be living right now things he ought not to be doing. And God is saying, I don't want you to do that anymore. And he's, he's not trying to rain on your parade. He's trying to save your life. But you see, if you know that he loves you, then you'll be able to receive from him. That when he extends his leadership to you, his kindness to you, his guidance to you, you don't brush him off. You break his heart. It's because he loves you. Amen. So we're going to be talking about experience in these closing verses, and I think it's necessary. And I, as I get into this today, I, I want to say this, that... Um, and I'm just calling this a disclaimer. I wrote this note to myself, disclaimer. And I, I said this, basically to make sure I tell all of you, with all due respect, for those of you who are here today and you've never experienced salvation, listen, that you've never experienced salvation, the reality of it. Maybe you've ignored him. Maybe you've not allowed him to work in your life. I don't know. Maybe you're religious, but you have no relationship. You need to know something. You need to know that we know what you know. We know where you're at. We've been where you are now regarding experiencing salvation. You can talk about it until you're almost a Christian. You can go to church all your life. But if you have not encountered the God that Abraham encountered or the God that David encountered, the God that those who follow Jesus have encountered, this is a very, very serious thing. We who have, we know where you're at. But you do not know where we're at. Listen, we can both criticize where we're at and where you're at because we've lived on both sides of the fence. You've only lived on one side of the fence. So you, you, you go, I don't, I don't believe that. What about this and what about the other? Listen, we, we tolerate you. We lovingly tolerate you because we look at you with some sympathy because we remember what it's like to be where you're at. You talk about the things of God, but there's been no explosion in your life. There's been no change. There's been no transformation as we talked about last week. Nothing's changed. You go in and out of church and nothing's ever happened. There's no event where you can say, God moved in my life. Listen, what if I were to say today, and by the way, this is why fellowship is so important in more now than ever before. That somebody in your group of friends should be able to say to you, what, what's God doing in your life? You need these kinds of friends. You say, Pastor, that freaks me out. All the more you need these kind of friends. Come on, let's not, let, listen, let's not go to the doctor and get a Band-Aid put on cancer. Time is running out. You sense it in the world around us. Things are going goofy crazy. According to the Bible, everything's falling right into place. Christ is coming back. This world, this world is unlike any other time in human history. And all these things are in alignment. And I would just say to you right now, make sure that you have encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know some of you are going to write me and you say, Pastor, I'll have you know that I have a PhD from Fuller or a PhD from Westmont. Or I've got a doctorate from Biola. And the, the, you shouldn't mention the word experience because it causes people to lean upon experiential Christianity. Listen, you can pontificate that all you want. The truth of the matter is, when Abraham met God, it freaked him out and transformed his life. When, when Saul of Tarsus encountered God on the road to Damascus, it freaked him out. He met God. Today we have settled for something that the first century church and the Old Testament prophets wouldn't even recognize. They would expect to see lives on fire for God, yes. burning for God. 
I don't know what would happen if David or if, if Paul showed up today and say, I mean, we'd say, but you want to come to our church on Sunday? And, and Paul showed up and he's, what is, this is not church, he would say. What is going on here? It's, it's like, this kind of reminds me of the, of the Roman morgue. <laughs> we sing, we sing with a half a voice, we clap with a half a hand, and we, and we you know, sometimes read our Bibles. Paul would say, it's our life. <laughs> I was blind. I was, I, I, he, his, his presence blew me away. Listen, you say, Jack, you're getting out of hand. Tell that to Martin Luther, the great yeah. Catholic reformer. His life was radically changed. Yes. Man, if you ever get a chance, I forget the name of the city. It's in Germany, the town, but it's there. It's a museum piece. You go into the room. You talk about not only him encountering God, but Luther is translating the scriptures for the people to read because the Catholic church didn't want the people to read the Bible. Luther said, nope, they got to read it. They got to read it. And, and Luther says, Satan appears to him in his room. And there's the wall that's still there. He picked up his inkwell full of ink and he threw it at the devil and that ink is still on the wall to this day. You say, man, that's wild. That's crazy. Listen, our experience as Christians should be absolutely radical. In fact, I got to tell you right now, I got to tell you right now, if, if us in this church, in my life, if we are not hovering near and around radical based on experience, I feel like something's wrong. I mean, I'm dead serious. If we're not advancing forward, something's wrong. If we're not getting attacked and threatened by people who hate God, something's wrong. I'm dead serious. Did I have too much coffee this morning? Am I telling you something? We need to experience God. We don't trust our experience. We trust him who gives us the experience. You get alone with him. You actually, it's hard to do, but you get alone with him and you actually say, Lord, speak to me. Just speak to me, God. If that doesn't work, go climb a tree. If that doesn't work, take a walk. If that doesn't work, I don't know, what's your thing? Go ride your bike, take a hike. What is it for you that clears the webs? Amen. He'll speak. Amen. I am not going to worship a God who doesn't speak. What is that? That's, that's crazy. He's speaking. He speaks. And we know this, verse 6, knowing that it's like what it's like to be with him. Look at verse 6, just as David. Can you mark that? Your life is to be able, my life is to be able to be described just as David. You know it's available to us. Right now, we, we choose that. What did David do? He, he prayed. He talked with God. He walked with God. He sang songs. One of the, you know, come on. He wrote this, look, read the book of Psalms. Most of those are his. Psalms are like songs or poems. Read those things. Women love David. They read the Psalms and they go, oh, be still my heart. But all the guys like David. Because David's saying, I gotta, come on, come on, guys. We got to go find some giants. I mean, I'm in the mood to take out a giant. Let's go, guys. You know? He was just the best guy all around, you know, representing us in life. Worship God, sing God a praise, go out, slay, listen, slay, as it were, the demonic evil forces of this world by our obedience to Christ. We punish disobedience. The scripture says, did you know that? The scripture says by our obedience, we punish disobedience. Wow. It's incredible. Letting the light shine. Knowing what it's like to be with him. Capital H. Jesus. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from the works. Apart from works, that verse taken out of that psalm we read earlier, I'm asking everyone who's listening, everyone who's viewing this right now, to stop and open up your Bible, especially if you are an Old Testament student, because what Paul is quoting verbatim is an Old Testament doctrine. Please hear this. What faith do you claim today? 
If you are apart from Christ, you probably claim some form of a works-based relationship to cause you to stand before the Almighty God. A moral code, ethics. These things are not wrong, but when you make them the mode by which you are saved, now they're wrong. Because you're involved in it. Ethics is good when the ethics are good because when there's a moral ethic that honors God, that's good. It's, and, and good works, it's good. When we do marriage counseling with people, I've mentioned this to you guys before. What's going on? Well, our marriage is falling apart. Why? She's always nagging on me. I don't know what the big deal is. I go to work, I come home, I pay the bills. Watch, next line. I've never cheated on her. Oh, I see. Hang on, let's give you 100 points for that one. Excuse me, you don't get points for not cheating on her. You're not supposed to cheat on her. Does that make sense? But see, we twist things around in a work-related relationship to where we, we're stacking up things based upon our measurements. God says, no. No, you walk with me and things happen. <laughs> God, listen, Moses was talking with God. Moses' faith started glowing. I think that's awesome. In a way, in a way, I think, spiritually speaking. This is kind of romantic, so hang on. I think when you and I are alone with God and then we go out into the world and live our day, I think our face glows. Amen. See, what do you mean? There's something happening. There's just something. I don't see it. I don't feel it. But God the Holy Spirit is still excited about our moment together this morning. And it shows. It spiritually shows. And David says the most radical thing. How happy is the man to whom God no longer imputes no, that's not what he said. How happy is the man who God imputes righteousness? Listen. Amen. Regarding salvation, God no longer imputes judgment or the law. Regarding sanctification and living from the moment on we accept Christ, God takes the positive route now he imputes righteousness. You see, what does this impute? Some of your Bibles have different, different words. It's an old English word, but it's simply, I like the word infusion. Um, it may not be all adequate, but it would be like this. God, when God imputes righteousness, um, the, I'm standing here, you're, I'm representing you. When you come to faith, okay, number one, God stops counting my unrighteousness in that moment. All of my previous unrighteousness is washed away at the cross in, the, at the, in a second. Now from this moment forward, church, do I have your attention? Yes. From your life now, since salvation, God is imputing or has imputed, given, infused, deposited his righteousness. It's amazing. You not, you not just go from rags to wearing something. You go from rags to riches in the spiritual sense. Amen. It's amazing. It's really incredible. Hmm. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 says, And you who were alienated and enemies in your mind, by wicked works. Anybody remember that? Yeah. I'm, gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you again. Let's, pre let's pretend you are honest. <laughs> Does anyone in the room remember that you once were alienated and enemies in your mind because of wicked works? Yeah. Every single one of you all of us were alienated from God because of wicked works. Maybe some of you don't know that. 
But Colossians says that we are alienated. But he goes on in that verse 21, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Here's the amazing thing. (laughs) The awesome truth about God's word is this, that he takes that which is condemned and he pulls out of the ash heap. For me to experience salvation, I've got to come to the realization of that. I'm fully convinced that the reason why Christianity is so dull in America is because most, quote, Christians do not appreciate or do not care or think about what they were delivered from. If you have a low view of sin, somebody will say it this way. I can't believe you worship a God that would send people to hell forever. Well, number one, he doesn't do that. You do that. We've talked about that. And we're talking about that on Wednesday nights. You do that. He doesn't do that. But the main thing is this. That this God that we worship, (laughs) his commitment to us to impart to us his righteousness is something that is done out of sheer love infused upon us. And what happens is he delivers us as a people, as a person who's condemned. See, the Bible says we are already condemned. We don't think like that in our Western world. He pulls us from the plane that's going down. He pulls us right out of the plane. See, the world that you and I live in, and so much in Christianity today, or so-called Christianity, it's viewed, or people view, well, I'm okay. I'm all right. I'm okay. Can I lovingly submit to you that you probably have not encountered or experienced the living God? Because when you collide with his holiness and his righteousness, there's body parts and metal everywhere. And it's like, oh my gosh, what happened? I collided with the living God. I'm nothing. Well, what's happening? He's reassembling me. He's putting in me a new heart. Hip bone connected to the... You know, he begins to put you back together and you're different. And I'm pleading with you today. I understand this message may cause you to never want to come back here again, but I have you for right now. For right now, listen, you must be able to take out a pen and write down on a piece of paper. I had some form of dramatic faith crisis with God on such and such or something year or whenever I was thus and so. If you can't do that, Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Even if you were brought up in the faith, there's a moment where you realize, okay, now, I got it. I am now making a decision to follow Christ. He's always been around me, and I've been a Christian, and I love him, but now I'm at this teenage state, or I'm 19, or I'm 18, whatever that zone is, 13, and I'm now going to choose. It's not my parents' faith anymore. It's going to be my faith now. That's that crisis of faith. Every believer in the Bible that we read about had a crisis of faith. And I lovingly challenge you today as your pastor, have you had a crisis of faith? Can you say, this is when God got a hold of my heart. He took away the transgressions. He forgave me. He covered my sins and my iniquity is gone. It's an eyewitness account to yourself. We ought to be able to say, I I was there the day I died and the day I rose again. That day, that year, you know what I'm saying, that season of your life. I shared this yesterday. I was teaching down in San Diego and I'll 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 share it again. I don't know where this came from. My granddaughter right off the top of her head said, Papa, are you going to die? And I thought, I didn't say this to her. I thought, well, what is... What, you just have a dream or something? What is, you, should, you want to tell me something? And I said, no, no, sweetheart, no, no. And she skipped off. But this wasn't true, you know. That's not true. She asked me, Papa, are you going to die? The answer is what, class? 
Yes. Physically, I'm going to die. That's what she was asking. Right? Because that's how you get prepared. The world should be able to say to us, if they pull out a sword or a gun or whatever's going on, and they might say, prepare to die. Say, dude, tell me something new before you send me to heaven. (laughs) What do you mean by that? I've been prepared to die since the day I met Jesus. (laughs) Right? The believer's prepared. Why? Because we got our paperwork in order. How was that? Jesus saved me from my sins. But listen, some people say, I don't need him. I mean, he's fantastic, but I don't need him to save me from my sins like a real big deal. I mean, I get excited about it. You should get excited about it. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to give you good reasons. (laughs) Watch this. Ushers, you can open the door. People are going to leave. (laughs) But you know what? You'll do yourself an injustice. You're going to, listen, not only that, but uh, this, what I'm about to read you, which is actually, this is a good time to make this announcement. What I'm about to read here is pure Bible. I'm going to read it to you on the screens, okay? And uh, this is becoming illegal. It's becoming illegal. What I'm about to read to you, several years ago in Canada, I had to sign a document, a state, a, 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 Nash, a, a Canadian document saying I would not mention certain things like LBGTQ and Islam in Canada in the negative light I, before I could come into the country. By the way, one of our uh, teaching series was banned in Canada. Why? Too true. So what I'm about to say now my friend Charlie got kicked off of Twitter because he told the truth. And um, now everybody's getting kicked off. That's okay. Here's an announcement to everybody. Inevitably, no more streaming. Inevitably. They're going to kick us off. I want you to know that out there in stream world. We won't be coming to you because it's coming very soon. For, because of what I'm about to read, the, the screen on the other end of your TV or your computer could go blank. Why? Because a computer is listening to certain words. And the algorithm is listening. It's not a human. The algorithm hears it, hears it, shuts off. So here we go. Here we go. By the way, got good news coming. I don't know where you're at in in, um, Truth Social. Have you signed up for Truth Social? It's coming. I signed up, but I'm 1,312. I've got friends uh, that have made it in. But... The whole gig, it's beautiful what's coming. Uh, You won't need YouTube anymore. You won't, exactly. You (laughs) You're not going to need Google anymore. You won't need Twitter. Truth Social's coming, and we're actually working. I can't believe it, but uh, they have come. A division of them have come. They're working with us regarding religious content. So it's going to be great. So here we go. Let's say farewell to all of our online audience forevermore. (laughs) Paul writes to the church in Galatia. Now as I begin to read this, ask yourself, have you had a crisis of faith? Are you washed clean? Are you safe in the arms of Jesus? Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery. You can't sleep with somebody who's married. Fornication, that's two single people. Uncleanness, lewdness. Uncleanness is bad. Lewdness is in the area of sexual joking or or sexual conduct or sexual provocation. Uh, Many posts, even commercials. Stinking commercials on TV are lewd. You got you to cover your grandkids' eyes between, between NFL uh, plays because they go to a commercial. Lewdness. Idolatry, worshiping things. Sorcery, interesting word. The, the Greek word is pharmacy or pharmakai. It means hallucinogenic, mind-altering drugs. Hatred, contentions, always fighting with somebody. You've just got to fight. 
you'll get in a fight with an ant. <laughs> Jealousies, outburst of wrath, temper out of control. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, people who divide other people's lives. Heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries. Revelries are like orgy parties. Drunkenness, drugs, make, uh, clothes fly off. First thing that happens when you get inebriated, by the way, is that your moral standards fall. Scientists will tell you this. I was in a court case where the special witness came forward from USC and said, when you start to get buzzed, the first thing that happens is your moral standards drop. That's how it happens. And the like. So these we would all say, yep, I get that, yep, yep. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I've told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You say, didn't David do that? Didn't David have sex with Bathsheba? Yeah, David fell, and it was a whopper. But David's lifestyle was not to take advantage of women. David paid horribly for that fall, by the way. You never would have wanted to have received what he did. And by the way, generations behind him. Next verse. Sorry, guys, I sprung that on you. Uh, Ephesians verse, there you go. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking. Combined, these are dirty, filthy conversations, dirty jokes, things that when you hear people, you know who they are. You, or you may not know who they are, but you'll be somewhere and you hear people talking like that and you feel like you need to take a shower when, they're, yeah. when you leave their presence. He's just like, man, that was a defiling plane ride with the people behind me with a foul mouth. You ever seen people like that? Yes. Listen, I don't know about you, but all of those things that are, we're reading right now, when we get Christianized, we have a tendency to look at those things and say, those filthy people. <laughs> Banish them to hell. Every single one of them. <laughs> May flames suck them up. <laughs> I'm reading about us. <laughs> or who we used to be. Course jesting, which is not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any idolater who has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. You remember the title, When Eyes Can Hear Us? For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. That means active, by the way. It's happening now. It's going on. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Don't hang out with them. Well, I used to be, you know, all big into pornography. God rescued me, so now I'm going to go witness to uh, the girls at the strip club. No, you're not. No, you're not. Somebody else can do that. You're not, you're not you. It's like if you're an alcoholic and God delivered you from that, I'm just going to go down to Joe's Bar and Grill and witness to those guys. Maybe you guys should switch witnessing ministries, but don't do that. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Okay, we're going to keep going here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Stop right there for a second. Did we not just read that in Romans 4, that God declares the ungodly godly, that God declares the unrighteous righteous by believing or by faith in Christ, right? When that happens, your life's transformed because you've experienced God and you're continuing to experience God on a daily basis, okay? You can't say that you're a Christian and you live like this. It's impossible. You can't. He won't allow it. 
Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Here's verse 11. Kaboom. Man, if I said, God bless you. Thanks for coming. Have a great week. You'd say, can you read verse 11? Please read verse 11. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Somebody should say amen. Thank you. Thank you, God. My gosh, I look back over my life, and if I would have died at that moment, there's no doubt where I would have gone. Would not have gone well. Verse 7 tells us, knowing what it's like to know the real you. This is the only way for you to know who you really are. This is experiencing Christ. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. To be free, to be literally freed, the word covered here means in the Greek language, that which has been atoned for, paid for, cleared of, no longer present. What an awesome truth that is. And then finally, look at verse 8. Knowing what it's like to be truly free, and look how I put this, uh, (laughs) free-er. I did that deliberately. Free, yes, and freer. The moment you and I came to faith in Christ, we were set free. The only reason why you and I would have struggles, is be, and we do, it's because we allow certain things into our lives. We're maybe still toying with it, or it's still there. We haven't killed it yet. That temptation or that pressure. And some things, church, cheer up. There are some things that you and I will never have total victory over until we die. That for the believer, death is the great liberator. It's fantastic. Okay, none of us are a fan of getting to the point. I don't want to have needles. I don't like that. I don't want tubes. Right? I don't want a Dr. Bill. You know, Santa Fe, uh, southbound Pacific something. Right? Car stalls on the track. Okay, here we come, Jesus. But a believer ought not to be concerned about where they're going. Makes no sense. I'm a believer but I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. Then you're not a believer. Truth is, you could be a believer, but you don't understand what the scriptures say to you. You don't need to live that. You can live free now. Verse 8 says, Blessed, happy is the man and the woman to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. No more check, no more clipboard. Susie, what are you doing over there? What do you think? (laughs) Billy, what was that thought? No, because the Holy Spirit lives in you now. He's the one that's doing all the checks and balances inside of you. Man, if we had to do Christianity, we'd all drop dead of exhaustion. Thank God he does it. So here you go. We're ending. Jeremiah 29, 11. Listen, I'm going to ask you something. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Anyone have a problem with that? Does that bother you? Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. I think that's one of the cutest verses in the whole world. God says, seek me. I'm going to go hide. You go, come, come, come find me. And his foot's sticking out. You know how that is? When you're playing hide and seek with a three-year-old, you hide behind the curtains, but your arm is hanging out because you want, they'll never find you. They'll never find you unless you give part of yourself away. <laughs> and when you search for me with all of your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord. Is that okay? Do you have a problem with that? Micah 7, verse 19. Will you respond to this? Listen to this. He will again have compassion on us and he will subdue our iniquities and he will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You You have a problem with that? This is God of the Bible, by the way. Should that not freak you out and give you an awesome day today? 
please listen. I know we're out of time. I don't know how to, man, I'd do anything. I would do anything I could to make this a technicolor reality, but I have to trust the Holy Spirit to do what he does with his word. Because I'm, I, 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 I've thought of like, you know, Billy Sunday. Anybody remember Billy Sunday? Because Billy Sunday would take furniture. He's trying to make a point. He would take furniture and break it. And people, and, and this, is, this, is your, this is your life with sin. And, and he was, you know, and remember, he's a great baseball player too, right? He was very dramatic. I can't do that. I'd throw my back out, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but I'd do anything I could for you to see the word in pictures, as it were, in technicolor. When you, when you hear this, If it doesn't cause you to thank him or revel in having experienced God, I pray today, if you don't know what that's like, that you leave here today so troubled in your soul that you can't sleep tonight, that you turn left and right on your bed because you're saying, God, what is that? I, he was saying things today I don't even know. I don't know this. I don't know this. I don't know what you think about me, God. I don't know what's going to happen to me when I breathe my last breath. I, I don't know. Versus we who are just like you can say, I know what you've, I know where you're at. I've been there. My prayer is for you to be where we're at because we're right here now. And that is this. That same cry that you're crying, we've cried. But we asked him to cause his word to take over in our lives. And a peace came in (laughs) that cannot be bought. There's not a drug. There's not a drink. There's not an app. There's There's not a bungee cord. There's not a parachute. There's not a slot machine. There's nothing that can provide this. Nothing in this world. So why not this for you? Why not this? Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west. Any navigators in here? Figure that one out. So far far has he removed our transgressions from us. I love that, everybody. Listen, you can go. if, if, If you got in an airplane and you flew east, when would you get west? You'd always go east until you ran out of gas. And then you'd go dead. And if you go west, you go west until you run out of gas, and then you go dead. But you can only go so far. Help me out. I'm failing in my... Ge- uh, north and south. Yeah, yeah, no, I know that, north and south. But <laughs> is, is, north, is, is, is north only like 8,000 miles or 18,000? 8,000 8, miles? Anybody remember? From, from, from the pole to the pole? It's, it's thousands of miles. It's not far. And then as soon as you hit the North Pole, what happens? You start going south. Thank God the Bible doesn't say, as far as the north is from the south. That's not very far. That's not far enough, not for my life. Lord, get it away, get it away, get it away. I don't want to meet the 19-year-old Jack. Get him out of here. God says, don't worry about it. I removed him as far as the east is from the west. Okay, then. That's good. What's wrong with this? Why don't you enjoy this? Isaiah 45, 22. First sermon Spurgeon ever preached. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. How much does it cost to look? Nothing. How much effort does it take to look? Just look. Just look to him and be saved. Amen. John 6, verse 35, we're almost done. And Jesus said to him, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. Amen. I, exactly, I can say amen to that. But I said to you that you... But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. 
That's such a serious statement. Believe, like Abraham. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. What's wrong with that? And here's the last verse, Revelation 22. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride, that's the church, which is awesome. She's in heaven at that time, Revelation 22. That's us. Isn't that weird? That's us right there. That's the future us. We're going to watch this happen someday. Come and let him who hears say, come and let him who thirsts Come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. I'm going to ask you to remain seated. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. I'm going to ask people to be still. If God has spoken into your heart today, we're going to sing this song. And if today you have said to your heart, I have not experienced a crisis of faith, but I see now I need to. Number two, if you have never publicly made Jesus Christ known in your life, you must. Today's the day. As we sing this song, I'm going to ask you if you want to trade your life in for Jesus, today's the day. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. That's why I ask people to remain seated. To get up out of your seat and you come forward and we'll pray right up here in a moment. I'm not going to waste time. I'm going to do this quickly. I'm going to expect you to be intellectually honest with yourself. If you sense a tug in the core of your being, obey him. That's him. Obey him. Get up and come, and I'll pray over all of you who come forward. So you come as God speaks to your heart. Those of you who are here standing to pray, will you pray this and mean it from your heart, though we all pray it together? God sees your heart personally. As I saw you come forward, it's so perfect, it's so God. Some of you are coming forward with huge smiles on your faces. Some of you very serious. Some of you, many of you, weeping. I want all of you to know right now that when you pray this prayer, you may or may not feel something, that's irrelevant. You've made the decision to publicly proclaim Christ as your own, and Jesus says to you, I will acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. And your life is about to change right now. You thought it was over. You thought it was broken. You thought what good can happen, what direction. And you thought all of those things that were against you and done against you and all the things that you did in life defined the rest of your future. And I'm happy to say today, that ain't true. Right now, God is going to make you a brand new person from the inside out. So here we go. Pray this out loud, would you? Church, join with them, would you? Dear Lord Jesus, I confess today that you died on the cross for me and rose again from the dead. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And I thank you, dear God. In Jesus' name, name. amen. 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 Amen.